Hello, my name is Carl Lloyd Hauser. I am the senior pastor of Grace Community Church, and I am so excited that you are with us on this podcast. We also want you to get connected in a church family. If you don't have a local church, check us out at gracemontrose.org. We want to make sure that you have an opportunity to grow and connect with God. But we pray that these next 25, 30 minutes that you spend with us are powerful, that God meets you and speaks to you because He loves you so much. I love how uh, Nicole's there. Did you catch that? That um, the ministry that brought her to Grace, she's now leading. I think that's pretty cool. And that's, uh, you know, one of the things that God does is He brings us in, and then the things that touch us, the things that He imparts to us, uh, we give away and we're able to uh, be used. I think that's uh, pretty exciting. So um, anybody here have like a really unique talent? So I, I, I love to see like uh, skills. Like I'm really, I'm always impressed by like, I don't have any skills. Like if the apocalypse comes, I've got no skills, but I'm impressed with guys who've got skills for the apocalypse. But I do have a unique talent and um, I'm actually like a little nervous to share it with you, but I'm, I'm, it's just so silly. It's just so dumb. But uh, do you want to see my unique talent? Okay, ready? I'm, act, I'm nervous right now. I, you know, I'm, I don't I get nervous anymore, but I'm nervous. All right, here it goes. The wonderful things about tickers. Our tickers are wonderful things. The tops are made of the rubber. The bottoms are made of the springs. They're bouncy, trouncy, bouncy, 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 fun, fun, fun. The most wonderful, wonderful thing about tickers is I'm the only one. <laughs> okay, all right. I did. Oh, bother. I have a rumbly in my tumbling. I guess you probably do. See, I could do poo. That's kind of gross, but I can. So that's, that's like my big talent. So it's not going to help me in the apocalypse, but I can do that. I'll be singing through the whole thing. So i got a, other, a couple other unique talents here. Do you know uh, Terry Crews, uh, that he's a, a flautist? That's not a guy who does flowers. It's a guy who uh, plays the flute there. So yeah, he can do that. And he's actually really good at it. Um, this one I thought was amazing. I had no idea. Do you know that Snoop Dogg is into coaching little league football? How would you like your kid to be on his team? But that's, that's one of his great talents. And so we're going to actually look at, uh, I think, one of the coolest, the unique talent in the Bible. Now, if you have your Bible, open it up to Exodus 31 and check out these talents, these gifts that God has given. And it's uh, verse 1. So this is about 3,400 years ago that this takes place. And uh, this is a time when uh, God, the Israelites are out in uh, the desert, and God says, okay, it's time to build a tabernacle. And so we're gonna, um, I'm, I'm going to bring people together to do this amazing work, a place where you can worship me, sacrifice, connect with me. And so in 31 verse 1, it says, And the Lord says to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and check the, I love this. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with skills, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of craftsmanship. Now, I love this. This is the, the first spiritual gift that we see in the Bible about 1,400 years before Paul lists all the other ones in Romans. And did you see what it is? It's craftsmanship. It's to be able... Does anybody here work with your hands? So this actually, you can do that by the Spirit of God. And I love this. This is a gift from God, and He does it. He's filled by the Spirit to build. And so I just want to encourage you, whatever you do, if you work with your hands, if you do something else, whatever God has called you to, to do, you can do it by the Holy Spirit. You could do it through Him. And when you do it, it's amazing. When you do it by the Spirit, it brings glory to Him. You could build like a table. I thought this was a cool looking table. You could build a table and just like, wow, that, that like brings praise to God. Or, or maybe you, you can do a, like a, a garden or, or flooring. I think this is like, check out that flooring there. I think that'd be just awesome. Or, or you can like go out and do some landscaping and, and you could do it just with design and precision and give glory to Jesus. But here's the thing is it doesn't have to just be awesome. You can do it maybe in a way that's affordable. Or you could do it in a way that just blesses your customer, or blesses another person, or even blesses your family. And when you do that, by the Holy Spirit, when you do it for God, you are actually, whatever you're putting your hands to every single week is actually a song of praise. Isn't that cool? And see, God's empowering is as diverse as His calling. And there are hundreds of different calls right here. 
And so since he has called you, he will empower you. He will give you what you need to do that in a way that brings glory to him that's actually a song of praise. And you have to understand that you are where you are at for a reason, that God has set you here. And I love this, because Bezalel here, he just happens to come on the scene. This guy who just got these amazing gifts and talents just happens to be there at the very time that it's time to build a tabernacle. 1 Corinthians talks a little bit about this in chapter 12, verse 18. It says, but in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Now, you just happen to be here right now at this time in this place. And you just happen to be in your sphere of influence, touching people that no one else can touch, doing things that no one else is doing. Now, many people believe right now that we are coming towards the end of all things. And I, I think that's possible. I, I don't know how quickly it's coming, but, but I, I believe, I, if, if nothing else, we are in a seismic shift in our culture and in our world right now. I think that's pretty obvious. There are big changes. And isn't it amazing that God saw this time, He knew what was going to be, what was coming, He knew what was needed, and that He chose you to lead us through it. He chose you to be here, to be the ones. Like you are the people that are going to take us through these times by his Holy Spirit. What an honor. What a privilege. How exciting. And you're not here by accident. God has done this very thing. And now, since he has put you in this place, you need to know that he is extravagant in his gifts and his power and his insight and his purpose where he has you. That you have what you need for the call that he has on your life. Bezalel was called to build a tabernacle and to lead it. And God gave him everything he needed to do it. Jesus talks a little bit about this. I love this. Go over to Luke. And we're in chapter 11, verse 11. And Jesus tells us, Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now here's the question. Where you are, where God has you, are you asking? Are you asking, Holy Spirit, will you come and show me how to do this? Will you give me wisdom and direction and power and purpose? So in school or in your work or with your family or wherever you are, are you inviting the Holy Spirit? Are you saying, Lord, will you come in here right now and help me? And, and people in our culture right now, people are short on purpose. There's just nihilism everywhere. You know, what does it matter? Just, you know, do what feels good. Do what you like. But see, not with God. With God, every single job, even the mundane tasks and the routine, in the middle of it, God has something for you. There's a reason that you are there. There's a purpose for where God has called you. Now, if you've heard, I haven't talked about this for a while, but I, I used to really dislike preaching. So like the, the part of the job, I like the beginning, like Tuesday and Wednesday when I'm like planning and working with the staff and all the admin. And, but then every Thursday and Friday, it, to me, it felt like there was like this big boulder and it was called sermon prep. And then I would have to like push this big boulder up, you know, and, you, and then you get to Saturday and then kind of Sunday, finally you see it down there. And then I'd go and I'd have the day off and then I'd come back on Tuesday and guess what was sitting down at the bottom? The boulder, right? And I did that every week. Now, that, that's how it was, I'll tell you, it's not that in, in, anymore. But I, I found it, you know, it's kind of like um, climbing a 14er. Anybody here climb a 14er? Okay, so climbing 14ers is, like, if you don't like the climb, if you don't like the climbing part, I don't think you should do it. Like, maybe do one, because it's worth it at least once. I mean, you have to see, you have to stand on top of one. But, but like, there's one 14er that I climbed. It took 17 hours to climb to get up there, right? All right, and then you have 30 minutes of view, right? So that's one minute of viewing for every 34 minutes of plotting, you know? But then there, there was a time, actually, that, and so I climbed a number of them, and I was, I was climbing one of them, and I realized, you know what? I like this. I like the climb. I like how it's hard. I like the work that I'm putting in. I like, I don't know, just fighting for oxygen, the whole thing. I like the challenge. And, and, and I like the climb just as much 
maybe even more than I like the view. And so then if, you, if that's the case for you, climb some more of them, right? And, and I came to the point with sermon prep where I actually, I found joy in the preparation. And you have to know that like the preparation takes a lot longer than this part. And I actually, you know how it started? Is I began a number of years ago, every time that I would begin, I would just, I'd stop and I would just worship. For about an hour, I'd worship and pray. And then the preparation, it didn't become about like, well, I got to write this sermon. I got to come up with something good. It actually became about my connection with God. And it became more of like a conversation where I would just wait on the Lord and I would seek him. And it's actually one of the things I look forward to more than anything else. It's like, oh, I get to go be with Jesus now. Just wait on him, praise him, connect with him, see if he has something to give me that I could give to you. And it's changed a lot. And, and you know, the other thing, there's one other kind of key that I got here that, that's really changed the way that I do sermon prep. And every time that I'm going to teach, every time that I'm going to speak, every time I'm going to lead, I have this attitude here where I, where I say, this is my one chance. So this is my one chance to talk to you about Bezalel. I don't know in the history or in the future of this church if I'm ever going to talk about that guy again. So I was like, okay, Lord, help me. I got to do it right. This is my one shot at this thing. I was talking to a, a friend or actually texting with a friend the other day. And he's like, it's my daughter's 13th birthday. I was like, dude, you got to be there, right? Because this is the one time in all of eternity that your daughter's going to turn 13. It's your one shot. And is that how you're looking at where God has you right now? When you're interacting with your coworkers, when you're interacting with your family, when you're there in your moment, are you thinking like, this is my one chance to do this with them at this time? And am I going to do it by the Spirit? Or am I just going to kind of hope it gets over with? And, and you have to you get this. Your, your purpose doesn't come from completing the task. The purpose comes from the task completing you, right? It's the hike. And that's why I've hiked the, about 20 of those 14ers. It's because like, it, it's the hike that's the exciting part. It's the hike that changes you. It's transforming you as you go through. You do these things and you think they're drudgery and actually God is right in the middle of it. I talked about Admiral William McRaven a little while ago. If, if you remember, I, I talked about this guy, who, this Navy SEAL, who said, never ring the bell. You know, and, and basically what that was is like, don't ever tap out. Always just stay in, keep fighting, and the rest. Well, the book that that was in, it was actually a book that he wrote called Make Your Bed. And he talks about it, that he learned that he had to make his bed because when, if he was in, uh, when he was in the Navy SEALs, if he didn't make his bed perfectly, he got what was called the sugar cookie ritual. And what that is, is you go out and you roll around, or you jump in the water, and you roll around in the sand, and you get to carry that for much of the day, right? And so he learned to make your bed. And this is what he says about making your bed. He says, making your bed will reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you will never do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made, that you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. If you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. All right. So he put the big deal. You know, the thing is, it's like tomorrow you're going to have to make again, right? So what's the point? So I did a little research. I found this website from homesandgardens.com, and it gave you eight reasons why you should make your bed every day. And it actually, first of all, it talked about health and hygiene. And so what their argument was is that if your dog comes up on the bed and you haven't made it, it's kind of gross, Right. Or it says that it also reduces stress. I don't know how, but that was their claim. And this one I thought was amazing. Making your bed helps you sleep. Now, this is from a study from the National Sleep Foundation. I thought this was crazy. That people who make their beds uh, sleep are 19% more likely to sleep good than people who don't. Now, I don't know if it's because those type of people, like good sleepers, like they like to be around it more. Or if it, I don't know what the cause or the effect there. But And I, you know what? I could care less if you make your bed or not. This is not about making your bed. What, what, I, what I, I wanted to go through all this to, to help you see, listen, if someone could find that much purpose in bed making, then I think that you can probably find purpose in your job. I think you could probably find purpose in your family. I think God, if, if like making a bed can do that much for your life, 
th- then I think the way that you engage with others has a little bit of power to change things, a little, little bit of purpose in the middle of it. I mean, if we can find that much purpose and meaning there, don't you think you can find it in even those things that are drudgery to you, right? And then we have Bezalel, and he's doing these amazing things with his hands. He's making tents and poles and the Ark of the Covenant and these articles that go in it. And he, how he does it, it's exactly how you and I need to do all these things, all by his Spirit. So now the question is how? How do I do this by his spirit? Well, let's go back to what Jesus says here. And so we're going to look at two verses right before we. So we looked at 11.11. Now go up just two verses to 11.9. So we get a little context to this idea of these good gifts. And Jesus says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Now, we use that passage to talk about salvation, and it's true. It fits for salvation. And and we we use that verse to talk about God's provision, and it's true. You need to ask for his provision. You need to seek. We, We use it for wisdom and truth, and it's true. But did you see the context of that? If you go down to the verse we read, the very last one there of 13, it says, And how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So what it's talking about here in the ask, in the seek, in the knock is ask my Holy Spirit to come. Ask my Holy Spirit to be involved and I am happy to give you the Holy Spirit in whatever you do and the Holy Spirit is what you need. And he is ready to pour out purpose and power on your assignment. See, he is an extravagant God who doesn't hold back on you. But if he's called you to it, he's going to give you everything you need to get through it. He's going to give you the power and the insight and the wisdom. And he says, if you want to do it by me, just ask. Seek. Lord, show me what your spirit is doing right here. Show me how to do this by your grace. Knock. Lord, will you come and will you help me there? And I'll give it to you. And so, so think about like just one regular task that you have right now. One thing that you don't really like doing. Okay, ask. Holy Spirit, how can I drywall? How can I wait tables? How, whatever it is, how can I do this by your Holy Spirit? Show me, Lord. And he gives generously. He's excited because he's a good father to make this a powerful, make it an important part of your life. It's so good. And then we see that when we invite the Holy Spirit, when we do things by the Holy Spirit, everything by the Holy Spirit, that he is the great multiplier in our lives. So let's jump back to Bezalel. So we'll go all the way back, 1,400 years, to Exodus 36, verse 2. Look what happens. And it says, Then Moses summoned Bezalel and Oholiab and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability. Now you catch this part and who was willing. Now, it's one thing to be skilled. We have a lot of skilled people. The question is, are you willing to come and do the work of the Lord? Those two things have to happen. God's going to give you skill. He's going to give you talents. He's going to give you gifts. But you have to be willing to come and do the work. And they received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. And the people continued to bring freewill offerings morning after morning. So all the skilled craftsmen who were doing all the work of the sanctuary left their work and said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. Then Moses, I love this, he gave an order and then sent his word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more because what they had already was more than enough to do all the work. Did you see that? It was more than enough to do all the work. And if you will do it by the Spirit, if you will seek the Lord's power and guidance and direction, He will give you more than enough to do the work that He has called you to do. And see, I think if every single one of us, if we could give this, get this, if we could really live this way, in all we do, if we would just seek the Spirit in our giving, in our time, in, in everything, I think we would have to say, hey guys, uh, we just need you just to, to not serve for a little bit. We, we've, got, we've got way too many volunteers and not enough work. Said so no pastor ever in the history of church. 
right? But that's what we'd have to say. We, we, we'd have to say, okay, everybody, I just want you, it's been great, but will you calm down in sharing your faith until we could just kind of catch up and, and disciple all these people that you have brought in here? We just can't keep up with what you're doing right now. So we come to the Holy Spirit and we say, Lord, what do you want to do? This is my sphere. This is where you brought me. I'm a tabernacle builder. You know, this is my job. And what's my part in what you're doing right here? And if you will do that, if you'll take this and you'll do it by the Holy Spirit, you will see extravagant power and provision and purpose more than enough for you to be a mother or a father. More than enough for you to be Nana or Papa. More than enough to be a student, whatever it is that God has called you to do, if you would just come and bring it to Him. I mean, that's what He does. I mean, 5,000 people get fed with 12 baskets left over. And what does He use? Five loaves. Five loaves. 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 And two fishes. 120,000 Midianites. Boom. Wiped out. With what? 300 people. And then, then they bring 180 gallons of the best wine. What does it come from? Six jars of water. You see what God does? Catch this. This is good. He's such, a, he's such an amazing multiplier. When we bring it to him, the little that we have, he does beautiful things with this. So this is, I think this is my best sentence of the whole sermon. Okay, ready? So you, I know, you can write it down if you want. But, but what you bring is precious, and what God brings is powerful. See, what you bring is precious, and what God brings is powerful. We don't bring much. We don't really have a lot that he needs, right? But what we give is precious, and he does an amazing, powerful thing with it. And God doesn't want great results from you. That's not what he's looking for. He wants a sincere offering from you. A sincere offering, like, this is what I got You see it over and over again in Scripture. Esther, what does she bring? She doesn't have much to give, but she brings risk. Okay, I'll take a risk, God. And what does God do? He says, I can take that risk. I'll bring deliverance to an entire people through your risk. I I love one of my favorite passages is when God tells Moses, what's in your hand? You know the answer? Stick. I can use that. Bring that to me. So Moses brings a stick. Come on. And and, and with a stick, God does miracles, and he brings plagues, and he parts the Red Sea. It's like, I can use a stick. If you'll bring that little precious thing that you have, and you'll consecrate it to me, I can do something with that. David, what do you have? I've I've got a sling. I've got some stones. A little bit of experience. I can use that. I could bring an international, a national victory through that right now. Overthrow a whole people through that. And say, so if you want to see God move where he has you, you got to bring the little precious thing that you have. You bring the little thing and you consecrate it for him. It's like, I don't have much, God, but here you go. All I got, all I got is willingness. God says, I can use that. All I have is obedience. I can take obedience. Watch what I could do with obedience. I have readiness. I'm, I'm ready to go. Okay, let's go. I've got, a, I've got faith. It's like a mustard seed. It's just a little tiny bit of faith. I can take that. I can pray, you bet. God will use that. I can care. I can can reach out. Listen, I'm going to tell you, I I really, I don't have much to give. I don't have a lot of skills. But you know one thing that I do have is I, I really, really love Jesus. I do. I love Jesus. And I can take that thing and I I'll say, God, here, all I got is is that I just love you a lot. And God says, I can use that. I can make a pastor out of that. I could, I could make a difference with that right there. Because he is so extravagant with his power and his multiplication. And I, I want to encourage you. I mean, even right now, there's this moment. Just ask God, what do you want me to bring? What do I have that I can consecrate to you? What little can I bring to this game here? And God will use it and multiply it and explode with it. And there's different calls, you know. If you look at uh, 31.6 here in Exodus, you see Oholiab. His job, really, he was, it says he was appointed to help Bezalel. So the guy, his, his purpose there. Sometimes, you know, we're called to support 
in supply for what others are doing. So before I came here, I worked as an unpaid pastor for nine years. It's a little church of 120 people. And uh, my pastor there, he was just this, this multiplier. He just kept sending out pastors. And so my job for nine years was just to kind of get behind him and help him do, help him become a releasing machine that God wanted him to be. Like Aaron and her just holding up Moses' hands for the battle, encouraging them. And then sometimes God calls us to impart our impact. See, that's one of the things that we do by the Holy Spirit. It's beautiful. We don't just teach, we impart. Now in 35, 34 of Exodus, it says, and God gave them, that's Aholiab and Bezalel, gave them the ability to teach. And I love it because what it means is they're bringing other people into the work. But I don't want to just teach you. I want by the Holy Spirit of God to impart to you. It's different. It's more complete. It's actually more extravagant. Now I wanted to show you, I'm not making up this idea here. If you go over to, to Romans uh, Paul talks about the very, this very thing. Romans 1.11, he says, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. I don't want to just teach you about this. I want to impart it to you. I want you to be able to own it. And one sign that, that I feel like I've been imparting. So I, I told you this before. I love it when people will come up to me and say, Carl, when you said this during your sermon, oh man, it just changed so much for me. And then they're saying, and I'm like, I never said that. That has never come out of my mouth. It's a great idea. It's not mine. And, and you know what I love about it? It means that as you were sitting here, the Holy Spirit was saying something to you. And, and that means that the Holy Spirit was imparting to you. I want to be part of that. I want to be part of the work that he's doing. And see, the difference between teaching and imparting is the difference between knowing something and owning something. I mean, I, we can teach you all sorts of things that you can know. Here, here I'm going to teach you something that you're going to know this now. Go is the shortest complete sentence in English. Now you know that, right? Hooray. Did you know that there's 293 ways that you can make exact change for a dollar? Now you know something else. Here's another one. You can't lick your elbow. Come on, you want to try? Go ahead. It's all right. You can't do it, right? This is all things that we know. What do we own? I own the Great Commission. I want to see people get saved. I own a call to obedience. Lord, you're in charge. Whatever you want, I just want to do it. I own a love for Jesus, and I want to impart these things to you. Yeah, teach you, but impart them. And yeah, it happens from teaching, but it comes from living, and really from believing and affecting. Has anyone ever just affected you? Isn't it an amazing thing? You know, Winston Churchill didn't teach courage. He imparted courage to a nation. Martin Luther King, he imparted principle change, God-honoring change. He imparted that to a nation. Isn't that amazing? Ronald Reagan didn't teach about optimism. He imparted it when a country really needed some optimism. And we didn't learn these things. We caught these things. And I want to impart to you just a sold out, passionate love for Jesus. I hope I'm imparting that to you because I own it. I believe it. It's in me. And see, God is so generous and he's so extravagant and he's so good that he wants to impart through you. He gives it to you. He says, now, okay, now give it away. Now I want you to touch the world around you. And here's how, how you can know what you're supposed to impart. Here's the question. What do you know that you know? Well, I mean, what is that that's just like core to you? God wants to impart that through you. To your children and, and to your coworkers, to your friends, everywhere you go. And, and so what do you do? You believe it, and you live it, and you share it, and you teach it, and you give it. And people just don't hear it. They don't just learn it. They catch it. What do you know that you know? You can impart that. You know, there's a, a number of teachers. Like, I mean, the, these guys don't even know me. And, and they've imparted things to me. John Wimber, so that's, I got saved in the vineyard, so I used to go to his conferences. And, and you know, he, one of the things that he imparted to me was this whole idea of naturally supernatural. I just loved it because every, you know, he would, he believed that God, the Holy Spirit would move just like I do. And, and he believed in gifts and prophecies and all that kind of stuff. But he was just so calm. It was like, wow, you can do the things of God and not be weird. And I liked it. 
And, and I picked up on that, you know. I mean, his eyes never rolled back in his head or anything like that. He, he would just like, he'd just share what he thought God was doing, and it was powerful. Or Andy Stanley. I've never met that guy. I've been to a few of his conferences. But, but you know what I've picked up from him, from reading his books, and just every time that guy talks, it's just so practical and understandable. Like, you listen to him, and you're just like, huh, I'm, that makes sense. That's clear. I, I feel like he just parts that. Like, he can't talk about anything without just being clear. And that's not even what he's trying to do, but that's just what he's imparting. And then personally, I could talk about our executive pastor, Ken Lentz here. He's imparted to me, you know, he, he taught me this, but he's also lived it. And he said, Carl, you got to put a stake in the ground. You know, you can't be wishy-washy. you got to decide. Okay? And, and he would often ask me, he's like, Carl, is that your stake in the ground? And I'd be like, yes. Okay, well then hold on to it. Stay there. Hold on. You keep going. And, and I've just seen him do that. I've seen him live it. And oh, I'm just so thankful that God used him to impart that to me. It's such an essential part of living for Jesus. And I want to just ask you, Holy Spirit, or you should ask, Holy Spirit, what do you want to impart through me? And you don't have to lead a Bible study to change the world. Pastor Jeremy, I was talking to him on Friday, and he does, uh, he has got two jobs. He, he works here and he also does construction. And I just loved it. He, he said, I was up there with the crew and the crew comes up to me and they say, they say why are you so positive? Like, you're mad at him for being positive. Like, what do you want me to be? Like, be happier if I was negative? You know, it's like, why are you so kind? Sick of it. Hate your kindness. See, but see, that's what he, he's imparting. He's just, there, he's just being who he is. He's just going to be positive. And some of them can't stand it. But you better believe that every single person there is affected by it. I guess the question is, how can you and I, in Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, how could we ever be without purpose? I mean, wherever He has us. Because by the Spirit, we are never without power. And we take this little tiny thing that we have, and as we magnify Christ, He multiplies our gift. What little do you have? Okay, He has you where He wants you. And it may be for a season, He may move move you on somewhere else, but you are here for a reason right now. And until you complete that purpose, the question is, okay, Lord, what do you want to do with what I have? As I magnify you here, how are you going to multiply the little precious that I bring? And I want you to know it's precious to him. And then when we bring it over to him, it's powerful. And you're not just a mom, you're a spirit-led mom. And you're not just a husband, you're a spirit-empowered husband. And a spirit-driven and a spirit-fueled worker or student, wherever God has you. Magnify him and watch him multiply what you bring. So Lord, we come before you now with the little that we have, knowing that even that's from you. And we lay it down at your feet. And Lord, we ask that uh, we ask for your Holy Spirit. We ask for your Holy Spirit to come in the midst of this, Lord, to, to fill us, to pour out your extravagant power, your great grace, your insight, discernment, and wisdom. Lord, we ask that you would lead us and that you would guide us in the places that you have us, Lord. And God, we are expecting as we magnify you, O oh Jesus, that we will see your power, we'll see your goodness, and we'll see your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being with us. I hope that God spoke to you. We would love to follow up and care for you any way that we can. So come visit us at gracemontrose.org. Say hello. Let us know what we can do to help you grow in Him. God bless you.